Hey, dude. How you doing, Matt? I'm good. How are you? Good. Guys, why don't we just hop on? Why don't we just hop on the Zoom call? Kerbo's on now. We can catch you up now. All right. All right. Yo. It's a good word. How much? Hold on. I gotta connect my AirPods here. If I can figure this out. Maybe they are. Oh, maybe they're connected. And say something. Hey. Oh. Hmm. These guys in Chris. Not, Kay, not, work, not working when you want it to work. No, let me try that just. All right, so we have uh, you, Chris Kachansky, Damon, Spinny. Spinny. Thanks, babe. Hey, Spinny, congratulations. Thank you. Um, how are you doing, man? I can't see. Doing all right. Um, all right. I'm making it. I make it through every day, and then I wake up and just try to get to the next. One day at a time. <laughs> Yeah. Father, fatherhood. Yeah, the father is easy right now. Work is insane. Um, is it? So you're at um, Normatech or Hyperice? Yeah, I guess it's uh, Hyperice. Um, this is an open form as much as possible. Um, but first, Amy, introduce yourself. Give us like two minutes on who you are and you know, how the race got started, because I think it's pretty, it's pretty cool that it's grown in this size in only what, 650 yeah. days? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's amazing how quickly it's uh, picked up. Yeah, thanks for having me on the call. And I definitely am interested to hear who the other athletes are that are signed up and what courses you're signed up for. Um, yeah, so we kicked off SBT Gravel in 2018 is when the idea came about. And I think we hit the kind of ideal time. It was, um, there, at the time there was no other major gravel race in the Rocky Mountains. And so um, we had traveled to Dirty Kanza and thought like, okay, well that was amazing, but we have gravel roads just the same here. And we have this amazing infrastructure and steamboat that is really used to accommodating thousands of people, tens of thousands of people at a time for the ski season. So if we have this resort that's backed by a ranching community and um, really open space, this would be an ideal place to put on a race. And um, people have been riding gravel here for, we, we certainly didn't discover these roads two years ago. It's been the guys at Moots and um, all the other riders around town. It used to be on road bikes, but oh, yeah. they- Oh yeah, Bar you know, back to those rides I did with Barkley. We yeah, have the exactly ride was right. on dirt. Yeah, half of it would be on dirt. And that was 20 just- years ago. Yeah, and now it's like, oh, it's so much better when you actually have a, a 32s or 35s on um, tires. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it makes it, it makes it different, but we discovered we have almost 700 miles of connected gravel roads in our county, in Route County. So wow. it really became a no brainer to put on a race. And we, we sat down and thought, should this race be like a regional thing or a steamboat thing or the state of Colorado? And we just thought this, we can, we can accommodate a really an international race and let's get it out there and let's put some marketing behind this and make sure we reach a, a really broad audience. So I think we're lucky to have Steamboat and this environment that is really set up to put on a great gravel race and to support a weekend of, of riding. Um, and then we really put the foundation on it of something that we wanted it to be incredibly inclusive. And I know that term is thrown around a lot, but what we meant by that is 
whoever you are, you, you feel welcome here. If this is your first time racing, we didn't do anything special for the pros. Um, and that's really different than other races. There, there are no hand ups. If, if you're Ted King, or if you're brand new to racing, you get off your bike to fill your water bottle. Um, if there were no call ups, so you line yourself up where you want in the race. Um, we did equal prize purses for men and women. So we really tried to create something that we cut down awesome. a lot of the barriers that are intimidating in gravel racing. Um, another is most gravel races don't have signs out on course. So you're navigating around or you have to understand how your Garmin or Wahoo work to, to make your way around. And we really wanted good signage. So people don't have to worry about that or getting food on the course um, or your meal afterwards. Like we really thought through what's the dream race and for us in our opinions, and let's put that on and let's think through all those things that are stress points for racers in addition to riding their bikes far and let's remove those barriers and then they can hop on their bikes and ride and not worry about the other stuff. So that's really the background on what we tried to create with SBT Gravel. And luckily in the first year, it, it went off well and we got really positive feedback and um, we're full steam ahead in planning. And in fact, Susie is a key member of the team and she is kind of running a lot for SBT as well. So really lucky to have her on board and we're going forward with a lot of the same things we set up and it's just bigger this year. We have 3000 people. Um, sold out again in under 10 minutes. So it's, um, it'll be that, that same, we want to create that same experience that everyone feels like that was amazing. I'm bringing my family next year and I want to do it every year forever. So that's us. And then in we're all allowed to get out to Colorado. It's going to be an insane amount of energy. Totally. That's, I think it's pent up energy right now. Like we're, we certainly didn't have a, any trouble filling the race. And I think from everything we're reading and seeing and experts we're talking to August is looking good. So um, we're, we're confident that this is going to happen. Nice. Well, I booked my tickets already. So good. Excellent. What are the race dates again for the, for 2021? August 15th. Yeah. Oh, the nice. race is on That's a Sunday. Perfect. And so the expo is on a Saturday and the expo is really worth it's registration, but it's also worth coming to. It's a lot of events that happen pro panels and live podcasts and yoga and shakeout rides and nice. a lot of good stuff. So definitely we get, weekend. we're running a gravel camp the week right before that in Vermont in Stowe, Vermont, which honestly is like a sister city to Steamboat. Seriously. I love Steamboat <laughs> yes. and Steamboat's the only other place I would live if I was out West. I'm not kidding either. I've heard that about Stowe. Yeah. Yeah. Stowe is like the Steamboat of the East. Yeah, yeah. for sure. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> the other, the other thing I would say for Amy's perspective, um, you know, she's inserting her own brand of humility as well. Um, it's just coming from a, a little bit of a racer's, well, not a little bit, a lot of bit of a racer's background, right? So Amy was a professional racer through many, de through a couple decades, but also like, you know, is well-educated um, and has many, has had a few really high powered corporate jobs. So there's like a tinge of, you know, experience as a professional racer um, as a female, coupled with, you know, running a business um, that delivers a high-end customer experience. So like, you, and having done personally Leadville, Dirty Kanza, I don't know, I keep going down the list, right? Like um, Raspatitsa, like all those kind of like check the box races, as well as a few, many Ironmans, like this is a premier event, you know, like all of you are signed up. I don't, I'm not trying to oversell it. It's just, <laughs> you know, from a, delivers yeah it does, just delivers right like you get your bang for the buck but then you're also like in a wonderful place so a lot of those logistical aspects you don't um necessarily have to worry about awesome thanks Bob. and so and so your other your better half next to you Susie, give a quick quick uh introduction of yourself because you're doing a lot with amy this year in uh and putting it on the race making it happen you basically live in steamboat a lot uh you have there. You raced the race. Um, we split our time between Denver and Steamboat and kind of I grew up um, with my family skiing in Steamboat and kind of learning the back roads and ins and outs and um, I joined Amy uh, about a month ago as the director of administrative services so kind of do you know 
some of Matt's background, which is, you know, all the accounting and finance stuff, but as well as logistics and, um, you know, working on the VIP party, which will be fun as well as, you know, talking to some of the sponsors and so on and so forth. So just, you know, really trying to make sure the nuts and the bolts uh, deliver the way we want them. And you have that, that racer rider experience. Um, and I know Matt's going to go through how his experience went and Cliff also did the black course in 19 and I did the blue course, which is the hundred mile, um, We've both obviously ridden all the roads, but I can, you know, as much fun as it is to hear Matt's rendition of it, I can tell you more as a middle of a packer what my experiences were too. So any questions along there, um, I might've stopped a little longer at the aid stations than he did. And um, no matter how many times I get to steamboat, like I definitely slow down to take in the scenery because it's truly stunning and breathtaking at, at any hour of the day. Um, so apparently we, I stopped too long at one of the aid stations because I get yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, you only came you only came in knife, Matt. What the fuck? I know, seriously. <laughs> Slacker. Could have been more. So so we did our introduction. Everybody knows who the um the first speakers are, but let's let's go real quick. Um we don't need Tim, we don't need Damien, we don't need John. You guys are just here to hang out and, and <laughs> wonderful. Um Real quick, go through, shout out your name. I guess we should do an order. Tim, you call out, I'll call out. I see your names, Moto Z's and Corey's and Chris's. Um, say if it's gonna be your first time. I think it is. I think everybody's the first time going out there. And then what course you're doing, Blue Black. And for now, your top course <laughs> that you wanna know about the race, whether it's what tires should I use, what pressure should I use, do I need to use stand sealant? Do I need to eat X, Y, Z? Anything you want, shout that out. And we'll start out with Chris. Uh, hi, I'm Chris. First time caller, long time listener. Um, <laughs> first time doing Steamboat. Uh, signed up for the Black Course. Um, riding at altitude. I've only done two casual rides at altitude. Um, both were in Loveland. Um, have done the D2R2 several times. Um, so, but this is actually going to be the first race as well. Um, not just at altitude. Um, and no questions yet. Kind of here to see where this goes. You're in for a treat. Rob, you're up next. Yeah. So I'm, I'm Rob. Um, I signed up for the blue. Um, I'm kind of new to, um, to gravel biking in general. Only been doing it for, you know, a year or so. Um, I'm actually uh, a guest of Chris's. Um, and uh, as far as questions, um, I'm just uh, kind of along to uh, listen in. I'm, I'm interested about like the nutrition side, I guess. Um, equipment side as well. Um, that's, that's about it for me. Awesome. And then who is Moto Z? Is that Cliff or is that somebody else? Who's Moto Z? That a flip phone? <laughs> All right, pass. Um, Corey. Um, so this is going to be, um, this will be my first time out to Steamboat. Um, we've done a few different gravel rides. Um, my questions mostly are, um, you know, I haven't even thought about the elevation really that much. It's something that's, you know, just signing up for the, uh, for the black horse. I, I, most of the time I, I could probably spend the next six months talking about, uh, tire pressure, tire type and, uh, gear ratio. Cause I'm, uh, cause I, cause, uh, yeah, I usually suffer pretty good on all the climbing. So, um, um, that's pretty much where I'm at with it. <clears throat> nice. All right. Is that everybody? Angela. Oh, me, me. Melissa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. You were um, here at the beginning. I, I forgot. That's okay. That's okay. Um, Melissa, I'm based out of uh, Boston, Mass. And uh, this will be my first attempt at Steamboat, uh, the blue course. And for questions that I have, um, I'm just interested in the logistics of how to ship the bike or what's the best way to ship the bike or uh, travel with your bike as well. That's something that I'm interested in learning about what was best for you, Matt, or others. Um, 
another area that concerns me as well, I'd just like to hear from the audience is elevation. Uh, like Chris, um, his other half, I did some rides out in the Loveland area and I was breathing decaf air. <laughs> so uh, I just had a train for that is something I'm looking forward to working with my coach Damon on. But overall, how do you get through that as well? So being from the East Coast and not having that elevation challenge. Mm -hmm. Sounds like some good recurring themes. I think we can yeah. off on that stuff. Is Angela doing this? Um, hi. <laughs> I, so I actually signed up for it last year and I was really wanting to get into more gravel. So it's very open for this year. And so that's why I'm on the call. All right, cool. Well, thank you everybody. I think for one right off the bat, uh, bike flights. Unless Amy, you're sponsored by somebody else, but I guess it's bike flights. No, bike flights, yeah. Um, <laughs> bike flights, 100%, because you can, if you're close, I don't know, is Bike Barn do bike flights directly? But I know like Fast Splits makes it super easy. If you have a box at your, you know, at home, it's literally punching in your address. It spits out a, you know, pre-labeled thing. You stick it on your box and then you send it out to, um, a location. I, I would assume that Amy probably has a partner set up um, yeah. steamboat, which I believe I think, I don't know if I, I sent my bike to cliffs, but um, if you're going out to steamboat, you can send it right to their partner shop. You can pay to have that partner shop build it for you. So you can literally just show up, pick up your bike, race, drop it off. They will pack it back up for you and ship it back to where you want. So yeah. what I typically do is, you know, either have Brian or Jesse pack it up at fast splits <laughs> um, if I don't have time and then literally get shipped out from there and then you can pick it up when you're getting steamboat all built so that's the way I would do it take that hassle out of your out of any you don't need to travel with it you don't need to worry about building it up yourself it's uh it's probably like maybe 160 all in something like that for the shipping yeah um, it depends on how much you want to insure your bike for yeah, yeah so I think it's a hell of a value for not having to track it around. You don't have to worry about it a bit and it's built, ready to go. For those that are coming from triathlon, think of it as tri bike transport. Right. Yep. And Matt, and bike, barn, bike Barn does do that service. <laughs> so yeah, I would just literally, I would show up with your bike and say, hey, I want this thing packed and shipped out and they should be able to do it for you. Yeah, and yeah, they it goes to a. We have two bike shops in town that will build it up. They'll just store it if you'd rather that, and you have someone else you want to build it. They'll build it up for you. You can really pick whatever you want to have happen, but absolutely recommend bike flights. It's really self-explanatory on their website as well. Yeah, it's a giant pain in the butt dragging a bike through an airport for sure. Just with with steamboat, you know, being somewhat remote, like just give yourself some time, right? Like plan on being without your bike for at least a week um, prior. I was gonna ask a quick question on, on that topic. If, if you have um, an event that's the following weekend, like the Overland um, and an event that's, I don't, I'm not sure if we're, we're gonna be doing gravel camp or not, but that would be one week before. We're doing rooted Vermont, that's two weeks before. So the time without the bike could be a challenge. That's why we're, we find ourselves leaning towards flying with them. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that? My thought is it's harder on the way out because you definitely want it to be there to race. Um, getting it back is usually no problem as long as it gets out like the next day. You just got to make sure that it's there and ready to ship out. And usually you can pay like an expedited fee to get it, you know, a two day instead of a ground. Um, so it's just a little bit more money. But to your point of losing your bike, yeah, I mean, it, it's worse because you're trying to do gravel and gravel so you want your gravel bike um versus mm -hmm. hey, need a ride so i can ride my mountain bike or i can ride my road bike um so then yeah if you're if you definitely need your bike you're kind of sol in that regards you gotta you gotta travel with it um but if you can finagle it with with timing you know that bike flights is the way to go but yeah it's tough i understand there's a lot of races backed up together <laughs> Yeah, well, they're all the same discipline. Like that, you can do <laughs> load bring two bikes out. <laughs> yeah. Um, plus one. But yeah, this, see how see how it gets the closer you are, and, and when you when you really need the bike and and play with the shipping dates. Um, 
All right. So I think that's good. I think that we should talk about altitude because everyone wants to talk about altitude. And we're going to we're going to bring Tim in here a little bit. Um, my my own experience with it is that I didn't have much of an issue. Um, it's probably super personal, but you don't get insanely high. Um, you what do you top out about eighty five hundred? Yeah, that's right. It's yeah, it's um, it's I think it's like eighty four, but yeah, it's right. It's not in the the nines, tens. So uh, steam yeah. the highest point. So the I think the base elevation is sixty six hundred. Right. So it's you know it's definitely a mile high, and so it can affect certain people certain ways. I flew in on like a Thursday, and we raced Sunday. It didn't really impact me too much. Some people think that you got to fly in a day before I would fly in based on the, your schedule. You know, if you have time to get out a little bit early, get out earlier. If you can't, don't worry about it. Um, the biggest thing I will say with altitude is that, uh, you really got to keep it under like the red line. The only time I actually felt like crap was the beginning of the race on the first big hill we hit. Um, actually it was the second big hill, I think. Yeah, it's airport and then fly and gulch. Then yeah, it's the second one, I think. And so we, we got over that the first windy one. And then there was a second one that was really long and gradual. It's and I was literally off the front of the whole race and I felt really good for about 38 seconds. Um, and then I, I like that was the only time I felt the elevation because it was really early in the race. and I wasn't tired yet, but it was like a wave hit me. I was like, oh, this is way too much um you know I was chasing the car and they're videotaping me I was like cool um and so I just went right back to the pack I never went over you know 175 beats per minute the rest of the race so I had to like stay with the groups to stay in the front and I was perfectly fine doing that without going like 180 and above and for me if I hit 180 and above that's like I'm operating on full full gas all cylinders but I think you got to find where you're where that red line is for you, whether it's 160, 150, even 140 beats per minute for some people. Um, that's the biggest thing I, I would test out in your training because you don't need altitude to find out where that peak limiter or that peak holy shit range is. Um, and if you keep it below that, you'll be fine. And so they, that's, I think, the biggest piece you can work with your coach is to understand where exactly that limit is and know that on race day, no matter how excited I am, no matter how much I want to chase my buddy, I'm not going to go over that for the first half of the race. And I guarantee you won't hit it the next half of the race because you'll be tired. But the first half, when you have that energy, that's when you got to keep yourself in check. Matt, would you say that's kind of like sweet spot, kind of that little range right there? You want to operate in that sweet spot and not go above. Cool. Yeah. How long is the event in terms of time? Um, great question. I'm going to bring up my training peaks and then we're going to have a round table. So my, my time was 645. So, yeah. So and that was for uh, the black. Kind of mine for yeah. miles. And so, I was going to say, what's what normal your guys time? time? Mine was eight. And I was 615 for the hundred. Um, and I came in like, I think top 10 for 40 to 50 year olds. So it's, you know, it's an Ironman, more or less. It's an Ironman effort, Tim. Yep. Um, uh, right. So I just don't, it actually really isn't that high. I mean, not, for, for those of us coming from the Boston area, it actually will feel somewhat high, uh, but it's actually not that bad. Once you get up towards the 10,000 foot range, then, then you start sucking wind and, you know, breathing through a straw. The biggest thing I can recommend is uh, Matt kind of alluded to it. I don't think it's something that you're going to necessarily practice um, here in the round here. What you can do, though, is really get a firm understanding of where your threshold, probably threshold heart rate or threshold wattages are and stay below that as much as possible. Um, once you go above threshold, it exponentiates very quickly. Um, but if you can stay below threshold, you'll probably be okay. Um, 
now with the with the race being as long as it is, you just want to limit how much you go above threshold. I imagine that there are probably going to be instances on the course where you're going to have to go above threshold just because of the terrain. Um, some of the climbs are probably, it sounds like that first climb that Matt was talking about, you know, especially when things get steep. Are there any steep, really steep climbs on the course? Um, there's like pitches when you say of, yeah, that's a good example. We have three major oh. climbs that pitches okay. that are steep. Yeah, so you're just really going to want to be careful of those kinds of pitches. You're also going to want to be careful of something that Matt was talking about. I would say altitude is an attitude. Um, you know, the, if you, Matt, got, sounds like you got into the trap of the hype. Um, yeah, you can see it right here. This is exactly where it happened. You know, like. You hit Go back to your training peaks, Matt. You're showing your. Yeah, I'm looking, at, I'm looking at a paragraph. Um, you're showing your <laughs> is, it this, is this better? Yeah, there you go. There By the way, I would recommend everyone read Matt's blog. On the race. Whoa, whoa, read it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can see, like, we hit these first little bumps at the beginning of the race. And hopefully we can kind of organically go through the course as we... As well, we hold on, Matt. Just hold on. Never mind the bumps, because the, bam the bumps are there and you can't control those. The yeah. things that there were, there were other, quote unquote, bumps on the course that Matt fell victim to, it sounds like. And it sounds like the car... The, the cameras um, kind of being excited, okay? That's not gonna happen to probably anyone else on this call, but you have to be careful of the pre-race hype and the energy that goes out at the beginning of the race and all of the others around you who are gonna be approaching probably the opening of the race uh, at an intensity that is um, going to be naturally elevated, um, pun intended, I guess. The and so you just have you're gonna have to fight that and probably at altitude, okay, it will probably tend to be good, especially if you're gonna have these these climbs early on. It will tend to be good to feel like you are going backwards in a really long race like this. You you it will serve you well um, later on in the day. Yeah, and those those kind of climbs. I mean, you have five world class coaches on here with including Amy and Angela, like. So I'm the least qualified to speak, but you know, it is not unlike Leadville or Ironman in that way, or marathon for that matter, right? Like where it's just a kind of a negative split type look at things. But those second that corkscrew climb that's towards the end there, as well as Trout Creek, um, those come late, like late in the day, gets hot. Yeah, last year was hot. Right. I was um, going to actually add that at the end is um, it does get hot, but keep in mind our start temperature, even though it was August 16th in 2019, it was 30 something. It was like 38 degrees. And I have to say the like mass rollout I loved because I just talked to myself in between riders to create some warmth. And then once you finally got up your first, like those smaller ones at the beginning, like then I started to warm up. But I, surprisingly kept it's not like new england where you go back and the morning is dewy and you're sweat fest in three seconds it's um it's dry and that it's crisp and and it can the cold can bite you but it does warm up a good it can be a 50 plus degree range mm -hmm. in your temperature day and i'll just i'll just add in if you are at the beginning of the race early on in the first in the opening miles probably the first you know, 15, 20 minutes of the event when, when tensions are high and, and things are, uh, and uh, uh, what's it called? Oh, I can't even think of the word right now, but um, adrenaline. If, adrenaline, thank you. Adrenaline, that's it. I must have none. The, um, if you are surrounded by others and you feel like you are putting pressure on the pedals, you are probably riding too hard. Okay. Right. Save the feeling of pressure on the pedals for later on, particularly around that, that, big climb at the uh in the middle there that's when probably i imagine the field will will have simmered down a bunch and have spread out and you, the hype will be gone that's when you want to be feeling like you're putting the pressure on the pedals if you're putting if you're feeling like you're putting pressure on the pedals in the early opening stages when adrenaline is really high and perceived exertion is low then you are probably greatly over threshold and, you, and you're more apt to get into trouble 
Hey, Amy, can you tell that we all have massive triathlon backgrounds? With <laughs> how we're leading I, yeah, this I, I know. I, no, I know. It's, it's a smart way to, to race long. Um, but, and it all depends where you want to finish. <laughs> right? Yep. Oh, yeah. absolutely. It's, it's making the most out of your day. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's, there's always risk rewarding, especially with, with the bike racing and then this is essentially a new genre that's really picked up in the last few years. And, you know, I've, we've had talked with Cliff many times about dirty Kansas and how to race a dirty Kansas where you don't really have hills. And is it worth going out a little harder for the first hour to make sure you make that far up group? Is it maybe? And if it is, then you prepare that way and, and you take it on that way. But if your goal is to literally go as fast as you can throughout the whole day, then it's a different approach. Um, yeah, totally true. Yeah, it depends if you want to finish in the top, you have to start in those wheels and know you're going to, um, you might blow up at some point, but that's a very unique strategy if you want to finish in that top percentage. Yep. I so made a mistake. It's not in that fun group at Turkey Kansas. But that all being said, Matt or Amy, like, do you want to, or Tim, like, do you want to comment? I was just took some notes for the people's questions. Like, with regards to nutrition as well and altitude is, you know, Tim having done Leadville a couple of times, like- Do you make changes? Do, are there changes? Do you fuel it as a race? Do you fuel it more aggressively at altitude? I want to let Tim start this. Uh, I think you really have to be, uh, you really have to be careful, particularly for we Bostonians. Um, you have to be careful of drinking enough um, at a higher rate. You're gonna, you're gonna burn calories uh, slightly faster. Than you normally would. Um, sorry, I have my popsicle. Um, <laughs> um, so you need to you need to think about that. But then the other thing that I imagine is true there, it's true in Boulder, it's true in Leadville, is you do not have humidity. Um, so it's very easy to uh, remember to drink. Things are just dry, and you don't you don't think you don't realize you're thirsty um quite as easily so you have to actually stay a little more aware of the whole drinking situation there's a nice thing about humidity as much as it sucks it does um help to remind you that that you need intake um and i have found that to be challenging coming from uh um, sea level up to to a place where the humidity is probably what in the 40 percent what is it up there yeah, oh. not even. Yeah. yeah when like we went back to Australia in the summer, it was like it we, was... we started sweating getting off a plane. Yeah. So it is significant. So it's... I think from that perspective, just the just to the remain the reminder to drink, um, uh, because that that will slip away. Um, yeah, there's something about that those dry, uh, those dry conditions. They will just suck you dry from the inside out, and then you are actually just burning calories just a little more quickly. Fun little little side stat that's related, not related, is I think that sometime in the past, um, the Leadville high school football team was the smallest in size in the entire state of Colorado. So the kids who grew up in Leadville tended to grow up a little bit smaller than, uh, than the rest of the state. I think I read that somewhere, probably Wikipedia, so it's com probably completely false. But um, it's just a, it's it's just a reminder that you have to stay on top of the calories, okay? On top, on top, on top, because it can, uh, your your body's just under stress. You're just under stress. That's that we're not accustomed to. And so the way the way I think you execute that and like putting it into practice is like for what I did and I think what Cliff and what you did Susie as well is you start out with a camelback as big as you want to put on your back whether it's 50 ounces 25 you know whatever the size of it is you have one of those on your back and then you put a jacket over it because it's cold in the morning a light jacket and then you stock your bike full of two or three bottles depending if you have that third bottle cage so I would roll out full fully stocked because even though you hit those little climbs at the beginning, you know, you're not really going up the giant climb until an hour plus in. So 
there's and with any of these long races there's really no negative to starting out fully stocked because you're going to have the ability to go a little bit longer than maybe somebody else that doesn't and you always want to have fluid out there these races are much different than the iron man where it's every 10 miles is a full buffet we do not have buffets every 10 miles it's you know every 50 miles um and then you know it might be 55 it might be 60 uh, it, it's it's all going to depend on where they're going to put it, where the safe spot is, that kind of thing. And you're going to do it yourself. You're going to roll up and everybody's going to find a jug of water and you're going to fill your bottle and you're going to put your own drink mix in it if you want. Or they'll have like whatever, whoever sponsored, I think it was Goo maybe last year. Um, yes. Uh, so there, you're going to have, you're going to have a buffet to access, but you're going to need to put the work in and you're not just going to grab a bottle and move on. So Start out with the full Camelback, start out with the full bottles, and every time you hit an A station, stop and fill up every single thing of water you can, make sure you have food, and then move on. Um, the, I'll tell you from my experience, so on the map, I got dropped right here at the top of this thing. There was an aid station right here, and we all made it up together to the top of the aid station. I had launched a bottle way back here at the beginning of the race. Because I launched that bottle, I was a bottle behind for the whole race. So I ended up being a bottle short right up here. And I stopped to fill all my bottles up and Ted and four or five others kept going. It created a gap and it would be nice for me because I had a better ride up this giant thing where it was more contained and I wasn't on the edge and I probably set myself up for a better finish. But the fact of the matter is I stopped I fueled up and I had a really good ride the rest of, you know, the rest of the race. My heart rate stayed high. I was hydrated. And those are the kind of things that to put in perspective, like just stop and fill up, get what you need and move on. So you don't need to be concerned about as you know, you're going to know what you want to eat and drink, what goes with your stomach. You know, you need to be training that and figuring out. So when you get out there, if you need scratch instead of goo, bring your scratch and put it in your bag. If you need Gatorade, take it, whatever it is, you know, that's the planning part of it that you need to kind of sit down and be like, all right, I got to fuel myself for upwards of 10 hours. What am I, what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? And if I need to bring my own baggies of mix, I'm going to do that. If I'm fine with goo, roctane on the course, I'm going to do that. It's easier if it's because you just take what's there. Or maybe you start out and you do half of, half of the race or two thirds race with your own stuff and then you finish with whatever's on the course um so those are the nutrition things i don't think anybody needs to be too concerned about how to execute it it's literally you're going to want to stop anyways <laughs> these things they're 50 60 miles apart um so you just stop fuel up and then get back in your pack and, and move on i have a quick question on it yep um do they do do, are there drop bags or anything like that? Some of the other long form kind of race things have like an 80 mile drop bag or under mile or something where you could put some of your own supplies in it. We did um, not do drop bags. No. So okay. everything you start with, you carry along the way and then there's no place to pick up anything extra. We try to have a lot at the aid stations um, that you might need, but um, there's no place to pick up a bag. And honestly, that's kind of the fun of these things is that there is a bit of a self-sufficiency in how you accomplish it. And you got to set yourself up so that you know how you're going to survive. Um, and I say survive, but it's like the aid stations are fully stocked. You are going to be totally fine. You just need to stop um, and do that. So, and like Susie said, it gets, it gets hot there and there's no reason to think that in the middle of August, it's not going to be 80 degrees or more at the finish. So as soon as you get over those first two bumps with, you know, a jacket on, you're probably going to take that jacket off within 30, 40 minutes of the start anyway. So you just literally have to shiver for a little bit and uh, tell yourself that you're going to be baking warm in 20 minutes. And, and that's, and that's how you get going in this. Uh, aim, what, uh, probably Amy or, or, or Susie, what is a typical, um, like what's on the menu at the at the aid stations? In terms, yeah, of, is well, there a specific product that 
This we'll year will be, um, we're still working through the details of that because of COVID. So, um, you know, in a typical year, we have bananas, orange slices, fruit slices, PB and J, um, and then all the goo products that you could need. Um, okay. we're, we're thinking that this year probably needs to be um, all packaged food. So we're trying to figure out how to, to do that. I think that will be true in every race that you do in 2021, um, figuring out how like no more orange slices because there's too much of people, different people touching them. Um, so we're still working out the menu at aid stations to keep it. So um, there, there isn't multiple people touching any of the food. So, so you, you got to peel your own oranges. The uh, peel but, your own but, oranges but might you're be. Thinking, you're thinking <laughs> yeah. goo products. Goo products will be there. Yeah. So that okay. will be the nutrition. That is the nutrition sponsor. Um, we had Coke and um, cold brew coffee at the last oh. aid station. But um, yeah, the, we know we'll have goo. And then the other is whatever we can come yep. up with. It is um, maybe you're, you have to have a, a full banana. <laughs> Yeah, we'll figure all of that out. Thank you. And someone had a question earlier just about support, like in drop bags. Um, you know, I, I think it's still TBD. Like last year was Mavic, maybe this year it's SRAM or someone. But yeah, like, I mean, there was very, very, this is not Dirty Kansas, right? Like you're not out there by yourself. You're not like mailing it in if you're taco wheel, so to speak. Um, the support mechanisms were, were world-class truly. Really. That's definitely true. If you have a mechanical, we have people out there. We have medical out there. We have a lot of people if you have different issues um, on course. And I will say it's a little bit unlike Ironman in that there is some unsanctioned support that there you will find out on the course. Um, Amy, I hope I'm not talking out of turn, but anything from a bike pump to a shot of fireball. <laughs> that is true. So, <laughs> yeah. Those, um, yeah, that's all, you cannot have your own personal support out there, but if anyone is willing to offer the same to every racer, then we said go nuts. And so that's how we came about some whiskey and some other things like that on course. But as long as they're offering it to everyone, it's, it's fair game. I like that. <laughs> nice. Um, so we hit nutrition, we hit altitude. Um, I guess you guys kind of want to like roll through how the course flows. Is, is, is there any, anything else pressing that anybody really wants to talk about first? Good. We're going to do that. Um, so, and just kind of, just because this is a course overview. Amy interject as you see fit too. Yeah, Given it, just, just blue and black. We don't have to go through the red. And <laughs> I saw these, um, I saw this through a racer's eye. So please everybody, jump in with with other other thoughts um what's spinny doing <laughs> i don't see him it's part about zoom it looks like he's swatting a fly um <laughs> he might be <laughs> the beginning of the race you they know growing his beard it's chilly but you get warm really quickly because you basically climb out of town and it's a pretty it's a pretty relaxed climb actually i i was much more anticipating everybody going that shit crazy and it the fact of the matter is there's so many people on the road there's nowhere really to go so you just kind of get in your little you get in your position you get up to the top of the highway it's all road um so it's it's not nothing too crazy and i think once you uh, get off the highway you hang like a slight left onto the gravel and you're literally on gravel probably for 99 percent of the next hundred and 30 miles, 35 miles, or however long the courses are going to be. Um, and then you're off. And I will say the gravel is not dirty cans of chunky gravel. It's not Vermont, baby head, rock, roots, and everything everywhere. Um, this is like finely graded, well manicured gravel. And you don't want to ride a road. Like some people, um, have mentioned to me, well, should I just ride my road bike? It's going to be the fastest. And to them, I'd say you'd survive on your road bike with like 28s or 30s. Sure, you'd survive, but it wouldn't be fun. And you're just asking for flats. You're asking for your bike to break. You're asking for your experience to be uh, diminished and to not have as good of a time. So 
you know, that's kind of why you, that's why you ride a gravel specific bike and you ride at least 35 millimeters, in my opinion. Um, I think some of the, some of the guys at the front were rolling 35 millimeter, um, relatively slick uh, tires. I did a 38 millimeter Maxxis Rambler, which has tread. Uh, it didn't really slow me down. And if anything, it gave me a little bit extra security in some of the spots that got gnarly. And when I say gnarly, it's not Vermont Overland at all. It's, uh, it's just a little bit bigger ground. Um, or sand. Yeah, but my opinion, like the extra security is so much because you don't want to flat anywhere. If you flat, you're, you're stopped and you got to deal with it. And the more, more that you can take that out of, take that away from happening, the better. Um, so really that's, that's the beginning. You hit, you hit this great gravel, you go up these really cool climbs. You're going to be super warm by this, this hat, by this point. I think you hit some, um, some pavement here after the initial surges that are going to kind of space everybody out. You're going to get into your groups. Um, I think, is this the part where the pavement is Amy? Oh, I think your microphone. Yeah. Yeah. So can you see, I can't see the mile on there. What mile is that? Where the quick downhill? Cause you're on pavement just for that one section where you pop out on um, 129. Yeah. It's um, like 28, 30. Yeah. Yeah. And then you get back on the gravel before you do the big climb. So yeah, that's exactly right. Yep. So, you know, you have that you can kind of break the race into, you know, quarters or so in the first quarter, you're going to try to get to the top. You know, the next quarter is a net downhill with a couple big climbs. And so this is going to be the, the time when your heart rate's going to go down a little bit and you're going to find more of the group and benefit from that. Um, and then you get to the base of it, which is around halfway. What I would like to ask, because I know it's out there, Amy, where is the part that I would call the Paris Perry Roubaix section? And that was a section where we hit an aid station and immediately went into kind of single track. And it was single track to me because it was dusty, it was dirty, and we had some technical, not, not too technical, but we had some turns. And this dropped a lot of people towards the front. I'm thinking that's at the, are you towards the end, like top of Trout Creek when you come down that? No, it was, it was, about? no, is this earlier? It was the early very end is Cow Creek. Uh, well, there's either Cow Creek or what about Thatcher? Like, was it early on? It was early on. And it's two-way traffic. It was two-way traffic. Because, mm. like, is it before Steamboat Lake climb? You do the Steamboat Lake climb, and then, yeah, you come back to that Fetcher property there, and that's pretty narrow, and that is two-way. Um, yeah. After that, you go around Mystic, is what we call, and that's just, like, beautiful, wide-open space. It sounds like it's probably not that, because you're thinking, like, narrow. It's yeah. Fetcher. I'm thinking it, was it wasn't it wasn't two-way traffic for Matt. That's the thing. <laughs> so. I'm thinking it was. Oh yeah, that's early. actually a good point. Yeah, you were early enough that it wasn't two-way. Yeah, so I'd say for everybody that's doing it for the first time, um, there's going to be prepared that you're going to hit an aid station if the course is set up similarly. Similarly, um, there will be a section that gets you know the fine manicure gravel will kind of go away for a little bit and it'll be more of a single track uh, Jeep road. And it's not gnarly, you're not gonna blow your tires out, but it, it requires a little bit more of attention. And so that section that when you hit it, and I'll try to find the mileage and send it out to you guys, but that was where, for me, I needed to pay a lot more attention, follow the people's wheels, make sure that I kept my, my bike and my body safe, and then you make it out to the other side. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of making a big deal of it, but it's not anything like going down a hill in Vermont, frankly. Um, but it was enough to spice things up, which, which was welcome. <laughs> so, I mean, that's kind of the first half. And then honestly, well, as Tim said, the whole point that we're going to try to drill in to every athlete's mind is that this is a course that's going to really benefit pacing. And if you do it really well, you're going to succeed in dropping a billion people on this climb. And the climb is steep. You get a reprieve. You're going to hit an aid station. So, enter this big climb knowing that, hey, the first stop is the aid station. I just gotta get there, refuel. And then this section is, it looks steep uh, in a map. 
It honestly does, but it rolls really quickly compared to just a wall. This isn't a wall. This is just a well graded climb. Um, you're going to be able to, if you have the right gearing, you're going to be able to sit and spin right up it. Um, and that was that, you know, that was kind of the defining point is if you know your day is going well, you're going to spin right up this thing. And then you know that, yes, I have, the, I have some pretty big spikes to come, but it's, it's mostly all downhill to steamboat from there. Um, you've kind of done all the main work by that point. Matt, maybe you could take two seconds to speak about gearing that you used or found that was beneficial. Yeah. Sorry about that noise. I, my computer. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm a proponent. I like two by for gravel. Um, some people are one by if they use SRAM, it might be one by preference, but I typically will always put a 34 in the back. So whatever allows me to run a cage with a 34 cassette on the back and then depending on like I've always had a 46 on the front because it's what I had um, like it's gonna be super dependent on what you have on your bike but anywhere from a 46 to a 50 on the front and as long as you have a 34 on the back you're gonna be okay because if you have a 50 on the front you're probably gonna run um, I don't know a 36 in the front so say you have a 36, 34, that almost hits that magic one-to-one -one ratio. And for everybody not to get too techy, you kind of want to be near a one-to-one -one ratio for not necessarily a first climb of the day, but for like the eighth climb of the day, when you're really tired, you're going to want to be able to put it in that gear and still make some semblance of a spinning motion on the bike instead of standing up and grinding. Um, so, so if you have one-to-one -one or better than one-to-one, -to -one, better than one-to-one, -one, you're good. You're good. I would just, I'm, I'm big on that in kind of any, either long distance, uh, overland, rooted, any of those Rasputitsa, any of those races, because whether you're going moderately hard for seven, eight hours or bananas hard for two hours, like a Rasputitsa, your body's fatigued. So that like that last climb, put it in the bit, you know, put it in the easiest gear you got and go. So try to <clears throat> what about, what about top end speed? That doesn't really come into play on this one, does it? It does only on the pavement on the way back from Steamboat Lake. That's really like that first big descent. Yeah, yeah. which is yeah. And kinda, uh, I had so. a forty-six was my biggest front, forty-six eleven, right? And that's you, that's plenty. So if you have a forty-six or fifty, you're gonna be fine. I would say you'd be forty-two ten. Forty-two ten. So that's yeah. A sing. What is that? Is that a SRAM or Shimano? It's SRAM. You're in. Yeah, I would say you're going to be perfectly fine because once you're on those roads like that too, you're going to be able to draft off people most yeah. likely anyways. So I think you would have to be going really hard to spin out. Um, yeah, the, the biggest benefit is going to be having all those gears for getting up the hills. 100%. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Amy, for the, for the blue, do you want to talk about kind of where – that turn is right, like because you don't hit trout creeks, so there's a little bit of a different maybe strategy. Yeah. Um, do you want me to pull up the map for it? The yeah, the blue cuts out that final giant climb. Um, let me see if I can even. Now, does the blue one. still finish with the corkscrew and everything? No. No. We, do, um, we don't do the corkscrew, but we do. That same climb to crap to Cow Creek, where you where you drop like Leado and that 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 final climb before Cow Creek, right? Right, right, right. right. Now, yeah, that was good. I'm trying to pull it up. Let's see. And I think a um, hundred in the blue course. There's about six thousand feet. Does that sound right? Like 6,600? 6, 6,000. Yep. Yeah. So versus nine. So it's significantly less climbing. Um, yeah. Can I? I don't know if I can share my screen. I think Matt stopped sharing. So you should be good. Can you see? So. Um, yeah, the blue course, the profile down here. I'm just on our website, so you can find all the courses on there. 
Um, but it cuts out if you compare it to what Matt was showing for his, um, this one cuts out that final climb. I'm not zoomed in enough for you to get a really good idea, but you can see we do 6,200 feet of elevation gain here. And this last climb is, yeah, that FNL that everybody does, um, this one. And it's, this one is just always the like hot point in the race when you're, you're kind of ready to be done. But you know, once you get to the top of that, you just have the kind of fun cow creek to go back down to the end. Um, there's a, a decision point in the race. So if you, there's a, a point where you continue to go take a right-hand turn or actually continue going straight to do the black course or you take your left-hand turn to kind of cut it sh shorter with the blue course. Um, and for reference, we had a hundred people that were signed up for black that made the decision to go blue course on race day. So um, it's, it's very kind of a, and a, it's an option that's out there that you can always make that decision whenever you want. But the, you know, if you're, if you're going straight on the black course that you have that giant climb that was shown on the other screen. And if you decide to go blue, you just have this one little one at the end and then you're, you're home free. So here's the total with it, just over a hundred miles and 6,000. So you cut out those additional 3,000 miles. Can go back to stop sharing. So pretty that nice, is blue. Pretty nice feature to have, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> See how you're feeling race day. People are always, always stressing over which course to do. And I'm like, sign up for black. See, see how you feel. Try to stick with black, but you can always go blue. To do tire PSI, I think we had that. I, gonna be honest, I completely have forgotten when I put in my tires. So I need to default to like Cliff, Amy, Susie. What what are you guys using? Because you guys are riding this these types of roads more or less on a daily basis. What what do you throw in your tires for training? What are you throwing for a race like this? Amy and Susie probably, Susie definitely doesn't know because generally I fill up her tires. So um, yeah, like it, I mean, it depends on your width of tire, right? So make sure you're looking up what type of uh, rim you have as well as like what, what size of tire. Um, so that's obviously important, but like I run, um, right now I have Rennie Hurst, which are the old compass tires, I think of the 42s and I have like 36 PSI in them. Yeah, it also depends on your weight and then how chunky the gravel is. So because our course is pretty smooth, like I run kind of high, like 35. Um, but yeah, it, it can be anywhere from 33, 37, anything under 40 um, for, yeah. And then you look at your, your weight and you can go up more if you're heavier. Yeah, it's one of those things where I feel like I know it the week of, and then I just completely space out and forget. Um, yeah. But that's a, another good thing, like to Damon, to you know, to everybody coaching, and to the athletes, like go and practice riding at intensity and riding conditions that are relatively similar, you know, like a fire road or just riding on the road, frankly, and see how it reacts to um, a long ride on the body, to speed, and you know a few PSI here or there isn't going to make a big deal um, in terms of being able to do the distance, but you could find that your back feels a hell of a lot better with a little bit lower, or you're able to just ride smoother around turns because you took a little bit less out. So those are things you just want to play around with in the months that you're getting ready for something like this. I had a, uh, a question with it. So like one of the things I think of with tire pressure, this is a, it's, something that is going to sit on my mind a lot really with it because of the uh rolling resistance and stuff for that mileage um like for my i'd say like riding on the road with my gravel bike pure road i'd run 40 psi when i'm riding cycle cross right uh, same tire same everything i'll be at 30 so are we talking like in that range right that 10 sw swing is it more like uh towards the road side of it like i'd be riding 38 36 something like that is that what you're saying because the gravel so smooth or would be that would be my yeah 
I would say 35, 36, even 38, something like that in that in in the scenario that you gave. Yeah, and get out the day before, right? Like you'll see what yeah, kind of condition so the gravel is. But Amy knows better and Spinny know better than anyone. Like the conditions of those roads can change overnight in a way, you know, from washboard to sand. Um, mm -hmm. You know, right now they're probably pretty hard, obviously, but um, definitely get out the day before and at least do like a little bit of the um, fly gulch the first it, initial right. time. That'll give you a it sense. Sounded, it sounded like earlier, Matt, said, Matt, you said that you could, it was, it was yeah. possible to do the race on a road bike, very uncomfortably, yeah. but on a road bike. So I would think that that would inform um, that with tire pressure wise, Corey, you, you could probably aim towards the higher end of that, just based on what Matt's comment was. It, at its worst, is the course, you said it's not too chunky. No. Um, I was, yeah, there's one, the very last section you're on is the chunkiest and that changes to Cliff's point very regularly, like two weeks before they dumped a bunch of rocks like on that section. And so it was, it was pretty rough in 2019, but um, there are times that it's smooth also. We'll do a racer meeting on Saturday and kind of give a report on, on what we're seeing. And the shakeout ride does that section. So you'll see the worst of the gravel on Saturday shakeout ride. And you can also make kind of an assessment then of how, how bad it is. But, but that's a small percentage, right? It's of the total plus. Yeah, yeah, it's a 10. You guys, y'all are listening. I'm glad Tim was listening because I was just going to say that. I was going to say, you can do this thing on a road bike. I say you can do it. You could do it. It, it, it would suck. Um, <laughs> be comfortable. But you, you can err on the side, probably a little bit more air. And most of this course, you're going to feel pretty comfortable with. And to everybody's point, that last section in 2019 was was chunky um i went down there probably much too fast and i still was all right with 38 millimeter tires now was i glad that i wasn't on 35 millimeter slicks at the speed i was going yeah definitely um but that's the kind of thing where do i do i choose a bigger tire just for that you know do i choose a 40 millimeter tire just for that one section when i have 139 other miles probably not um, I'm going to go with something that makes me, you know, enjoy and go a little bit quicker over the 139 miles. And I'll just, I'll go down that way safer or slower. Um, because that's always the options. If it gets too gnarly going down, you just slow down and you pick your way down safer and not put your front tire into a giant rock and break your wheel, which I've done at other races. Um, and keep in mind when you're on that section that it's a descent. It's a it's not a very steep descent, but it is uh, does trend downhill. Is once you get all the way through it, you hit pavement for the last five miles back to town, and that's actually rolling fast and fun. Super fun. So very fast. So this is a good finish. It was it was nice. <laughs> I was ch I was chasing hard. It was it was fun to be on pavement at that point, but. It's longer than you think. It is long. It does. All of a sudden, you're like, "Oh my god, I'm almost done!" And then you're like, "Wait, I'm still here." Yeah, <laughs> it's true. There are a lot of, lot of races that Amy's done has had that pavement in it, but it, it is super fun. Yeah, for sure. Rock and roll. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of going loosely over the course as we as we hit it. Um, I don't know. We we've covered a ton. Is there? Is there any like specific questions that we can we can touch on? You have a wealth of knowledge with the director and everybody behind this. So far away, if anything at all, um, doesn't need to be course related. It can be anything. I will add, I am the voice behind info at sbtgravel.com. So I welcome any questions at any point over the next eight and a half months. So feel free. And Matt's obviously got our direct contact info as well. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and if I don't know it, I will certainly get it for you. Logistics, where do people fly into? Uh, where do people stay? Yeah, Is we'll- Matt's like a you know, he's, he's Yeah, um, we will put lodging, there, we'll have lodging discounts up on our website in the next couple of weeks. Um, 
So there are lots of condo options. There's lots of Airbnb, but we're just finalizing a, a partner that will give good discounts. Um, there's also your standard hotels like Marriott Holiday Inn, all of those, if, if that's um, what you're looking for. Um, in terms of traveling, you can fly into our local airport is called Hayden. It's um, limited flights that come in here and most of them, maybe all of them in the summer are from Denver. Um, but there are a handful of those. And alternatively, Denver is a three hour drive from Steamboat. It's a, it's a fairly easy scenic drive in the summer. So um, that's, that's another good option. So if you're not from Colorado, it's a cool drive. That's I, right. Yeah. yeah. Right. You know, well, like I-70. You do it every weekend. <laughs> not as cool. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, those are all good options, but Denver or Hayden are your best airport options. Uh, bike shops plentiful in the there are yeah um ski and bike care and orange peel and ski house are our three prominent ones and then we have um a couple of smaller shops as well but we have we have plenty and then um they're really staffed up for preparing for the race and for the weekend um awesome i just threw up my website blog piece i wrote and this was for me like you know, fresh off doing act the actual race when it was really fresh in my mind. There's probably some useful nuggets in here. Um, can't hurt, right? So it's always a good read. I like it. it. I like it. Spin. I'm not going to read through it, obviously, but I did want to point out that I found what I was looking for because I made notes. And this is what a good accountant does they put down their notes. So you don't need to be smart, you just need to remember where it is. So the Perry Roubaix section is right here in the middle. And this is where I, oh, I know what that is. Failed to attempt to pee and ride, I guess. Um, so that didn't work out. And then I <laughs> hit the bottle and then we hit this Perry Bay section and it apparently started to get very real right there. Um, <laughs> the mile before aid station was right here. Uh, you know, this, the steady tempo that I said, you know, it wasn't a crazy grade, but um yeah, so this is some fun stuff, just some notes that I did when it was really fresh in my mind. You know, feel free to pick through it. I got a fun picture of passing Tom Danielson is always good too. That was funny. Oh, yeah, that was that was beautiful. <laughs> I loved every second of that. <laughs> and I, I put what I used during the race. So I, you know, I use the Ramblers. And like I said, any questions you guys have, you know, Damon's got my contact, Tim does. Um, fire met my email fire away. I'm more than happy to chat about this stuff um, in, in, you know, in any capacity. Um, I think you guys asked a lot of good questions with altitude. I think that is a real thing. It's not a crazy thing, but it's something to know about and, and kind of do those things where you keep it under certain intensities, put that into your daily practice of how you're approaching your workouts and your long rides. And that makes me, the, the last thing I'll say is, I think it was, the way that we coach and the way that we do this and we, we typically do kind of the Ironman build. It's a little bit more modified, uh, a modified approach to it, at least in my head, we've taken with cycling only as opposed to running too. You can go a little bit deeper, a little bit closer to the race, but I really tried to key on two back-to-back -back rides, like a Saturday and then the next Saturday of doing, doing something pretty big, you know, like it doesn't have to be 12 hours to mimic what you might be out there, but six, seven hours and go at it with really good intensity. You know, don't like stop two or three times to get your, your fuel, but don't screw around. Um, try to keep your heart rate up throughout it and make it that true overload. Um, that was kind of something I put in my blog. Like I did two really good rides around the Finger Lakes in New York where I was from. Had a t you know, the same elevation that SBT had. You know, I did that in about 150 miles and SBT was 140. So I did a really good replication of what, what kind of elevation or gain I would hit in my legs, not at elevation, but I did it at a pretty good clip. Um, and those are the kinds of things you want to do four to five weeks out. And that's a discussion you'll have more with your coach and when you're setting up those, those peak weeks and those, those big builds. But that was something that gave me a lot of confidence going into it, knowing that like, ah, I knocked this out solo. Um, you know, just wait till you're full of adrenaline with a bunch of people. So. And Matt, I just jumped in real quick about yeah. the elevation stuff. Um, you know, one, one, because those of us from 
from the East Coast can have a tough time wrapping our heads around something as abstract as, as elevation. Um, but one thing that kind of oddly equates is the way heat feels. So if you ever go out on a hot and humid day and overdo it, um, and I don't mean after, but like once you are operating at an intensity that is too great for the conditions, um, things go bad pretty quickly. Um, and elevation is a very, it's, it's a similar, similar beast with that. So hopefully, I guess what I would maybe recommend is in the absence of elevation, um, you know, don't go riding, holding your breath. Okay. That's not going to do it, but maybe ride at times that are, are warmer in the day to feel that same intensity, the intensity that you can hold on an, you know, 80 to 90 degree day is going to be similar to the intensity that you can hold at, at an elevation. 80 to 90 degrees in our world, not Colorado world, because it's different when it's so dry, 80 to 90 feels like 70 to 80, it's weird. Um, but that's just a, a decent parallel to help wrap your head around um, this thing of elevation. Tim, Tim, I just real quickly, uh, and adding to that, we all of our athletes do a lot of what we, term z1 workouts like a big solid base and that's going to serve you well just have faith in that 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 backbone that you've worked on i know my family has a house in moab and when i just fly in there and go mountain biking i feel fine i'm i trust that you know that big base that i built uh serves me well but doing what you guys have both said don't go over the red line as long as you don't go over the red line you're fine if you do go over the red line then you know rest take it easy after that point well, you get a couple of variables here, right? Because you have your red line uh, will will kick in kick in the ass because of the altitude, but then it'll also kick in the ass because the ride's going to be eight hours long, right? So <laughs> both of those things are factoring in such that our zone one, I, I realize that for others on the call, you may have no idea what we're talking about, but this very steady state aerobic type of riding is, that's the place to be. And it really depends upon your particular dur durability and your particular training volume that went into it. Somebody like Matt who rides a ton of miles per week, um, or at least used to, is able to take some chances with regards to intensity. He can push on the intensity a little bit. If you are lower on the volume side of things, then you want to be more careful with the pacing and keep your intensity at a, in a lower zone one type range. Yeah, it's going to make the whole day more enjoyable. You're going you're gonna to have fun on, the, on a beautiful course and uh, try to limit the risk of, of hating it. <laughs> um, it, it is an awesome day. It is a beautiful course. It's you know, it definitely takes time to enjoy the scenery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Very cool little town. It's a lot of fun. But yeah, do the, do the training so you can get the most out of it. Um, Way any any questions any comments you're going through the the next few months, um, we'll keep chatting. I, I appreciate Amy. I appreciate you jumping on. Absolutely. Yeah. Plenty of things to do. So thanks for jumping onto our little our little group. Um, a nice rock star in the midst of us, and you know Cliff and Susie. Obviously, thanks for jumping in, um, and being our our boots on the ground out there. And hopefully, we get to yes. ride bikes together in 2021. Yeah, definitely. I think Cliff the picture that Matt showed obviously he had enough time to shower, get back, like Cliff get, just finished. Yeah, get whatever award he had. Yeah. I was that I was just a schmuck. Um we we're still on for the, the day before, right? Lead for oh, Leadville. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Lead right. is happening. Oh yeah. You got your work cut out for you. Cliff and I are gonna do Leadville a day before. So everybody oh. will no, states a terrible idea. <laughs> it is a terrible idea. Yeah, that's a terrible <laughs> idea. I did, not, I did, not, I did lead milk and then the bread, the bread, bread epic, epic the day, the next day. Oh yeah, one yeah. of the worst yeah. decisions I've ever made. I'd rather go back to the pandemic. It was tight, yes. <laughs> well, what's yeah. uh? I don't. Ignorance is bliss. I've never done Leadville, so you know, I'll deal with it when I get there. I guess. Well, Leadville's not the problem. It's no. the next day. <laughs> it is. <laughs> hey, one day at a time. One day. Yeah, at a time. Right. <laughs> that's awesome that's, that's what the pandemic has taught me one day at a time <laughs> cool. nice well thank, thank you everybody really appreciate it i hope that we took away some nuggets from this and 
Um, hope to see you guys in the flesh sometime soon. Yeah, Thank Matt, let's you. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Matt. you very much. Bye-bye. Right. Thank, Thank you. Bye, yes. Thanks, Rob, Corey, yeah. Melissa, Moto Z. Bye. Thank <laughs> Thanks, you. Guys. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Cheers. Ciao.